Okay. Does that work? Hello. Hello. Hey, Jeff. Yes. Jeff, can you hear? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Jeff, can you hear me? I can. Yep. Can you hear me? Okay. Okay. I can hear you. I, I've lost connection with you three times. I'm talking to um, my supervisor. He's going to actually log in and make you the host because I'm having trouble. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. Yeah. Can you hear me? I can. Yes. Jeff? Yes. I, I can hear you. It's, it's, the, it's the safety one. Safety triangle. Jeff? Yeah. Good morning. Can you hear me? Good morning. I'm James. Hi, James. So I have Shirley on the line here, and she says that we're having problems, but she's asking me to make you the uh, host so okay. that we can do this because she's, her connection, I'm telling her, she, her hamster at home is dead. She needs to replace <laughs> that darn thing so that... <laughs> So I'm sharing my screen already. Yeah, it see. shows it shows that it, I'm sharing and that I'm sharing my audio. So I, I think I'm squared away on my end. All right, I'm trying to figure out where. Okay, I see you, James, but I don't see the screen. I see you too, but remind me where. Okay, I, I see you, James, but I don't see the screen. Yeah, where? I'm looking for where to make him the host. I can't find it. Oh, okay, uh, those three little buttons, go to his picture, those three little buttons on the side, click on that. Yeah, I see mute, stop video, rename. I think okay. it's because you're logged in. Okay, I just, I just made it. him the co-host. Okay, he's, he's now the co-host, so. He should, right. he has everything out. now. All right, I'm gonna get out then. James, can you see this, my uh, my presentation, my opening screen? Crisis control, the crisis control solutions.com and you have the charts, the round. Now, charts. Tell, me, tell me if you can, uh, if you hear the audio, I'll advance one of my, the slide here and um, okay. get this video plays. Yes. This thing working. Okay. Excellent. I think we're in business. All right. All right, Shirley, you get, you okay? Or are you frozen? Okay, it looks okay now. <clears throat> I'm not up the phone, quite okay? sure what's going on. So, so Shirley, will you be able to let everybody else in uh, when we start? Or do I have to do anything? You know, it's weird because it's actually recording now and we actually have 10 participants in when we're supposed to be in practice mode. Hmm. It, pra it records <laughs> practice mode. We'll, we'll edit it out at, at the end there. Uh, but yeah, you have right. the three of us plus we're all panelists plus there's seven attendees. So uh, Shuri, do you still need me? Okay, but see, I'm just wondering, James. At the button, at the button at the top is usually when I click on it and uh, start broadcasting live. I don't even have that option now, so it's just going now. I'm a, so he's co-host. I guess we'll be okay now because I haven't. It hasn't dropped me anymore. Uh, are you still in your practice mode? Pardon. Are you sure you're in practice mode? 
I'm not in practice mode. It, it didn't even give me the option. So this is live? Looks like it is. You guys have a great day. <laughs> Thanks, James. <laughs> Bye, guys. <laughs> Interesting. Okay, well, he... Yep, look like the participants are logging in right now. So we'll just wait a few more minutes and give a little, give them a little more time. And then um, I'll introduce you and we'll go ahead and get started. Okay, and Shirley, are you going to be on the presentation the whole time? Yes. Okay, could you help? You help won't me? see me, but I'll be here. Could you please help me and curate the questions? So I'm going to ask the participants to to to, to um, use the chat feature to ask questions. And then um, at the end of the presentation, I, you know, this is a lot of material. I'm going to get through it uh, as fast as I can, and I'll take the questions at the end. But can you kind of go through them? And because many of them wind up being the same. And can you just pick a handful for me to, to answer at the end so we don't have 50 people, you know, at, trying to talk at the same time? Okay, yeah. Uh, all the participants are muted. So anytime during the presentation, if you'd like, you can just ask me if there's any questions and I can, I can uh, ask you the questions at that time. Or if you wanna do it at the end, we can do it yeah, at the I, end. Just I notice that I end. do have a few seconds delay. Yeah, that's okay. fine. All right, I then the I will. Because it's I'll a lot of material. Perfect, okay. All right, then we'll hold off for another couple minutes and let everybody get registered uh, logged in, and then we'll go ahead and start. Excellent. Thank you. Okie doke. Okay, good morning, everyone. From the Welcome to today's webinar from the North San Diego County Association of Realtors. And we are going to be going over Realtor Safety, the Crime Triangle with Jeff Lieberman. Also, be sure to register for our fair housing and our multicultural markets driving home ownership, which is scheduled for next week. For more information or to register, please go to www.nsdcar.com forward slash webinar. Okay, so we're going to get started with today's webinars. If you have any questions, please insert them in the chat and we will answer them when we get to the um, end of the presentation. So without any further ado, Jeff Lieberman, take it away. Thank you, Shirley. I really appreciate the introduction. Good morning, everybody. It's uh... It's a pleasure to meet you. I I, uh, I wish we were doing this in person, but uh, we've all adjusted to the new normal during the pandemic. So uh, this is, uh, we, we'll adapt. Uh, my name is Jeff Lieberman, and uh, I'm the founder and president of Crisis Control Solutions, a workplace safety uh, consulting and training company. That's uh, my side job, but my full-time job, I'm a 31-year law enforcement veteran, and I've, I currently am a police commander with the Long Beach Police Department, and I'm responsible for uh, the downtown division. Uh, full disclosure, I've never been, and I know realtors are into disclosures, but I've never sold a house. I'm not a realtor. Uh, I'm not an expert in the, uh, you know, the, the, the comings and goings of, uh, you know, the real estate business, but I am an expert in, uh, in, in criminals and crime and uh, criminal behavior and personal safety and workplace safety. So the material I'm going to present today uh, are lessons that have been hard learned over time by, by those in law enforcement and through personal experience and through the, uh, the, the study of crimes against real estate agents, um, which I've, uh, I've been doing for about the last seven years. 
Uh, today, we're going to really focus on your most important self-defense mechanism, and that is your intuition, uh, that your, your safety, and your situational awareness, and your intuition. We're going to learn a layered safety uh, approach to uh, not only real estate uh, and business, but also your personal life. This material that you're going to learn today, um, you know, I encourage you to share with your family and your, you know, your children and your loved ones. And uh, I, I hope by the, by the end of this, you'll have a completely new view on the way you, uh, you conduct business. So let's get started. Missing Arkansas real estate agent Beverly Lynn Carter was found dead Tuesday, and the suspect's bizarre behavior is making national headlines. She disappeared last Thursday, and her body was found overnight in a shallow grave at a concrete mixing company at the Pulaski Lone Oak County line. 49 year old Carter initially went missing last Thursday when she was scheduled to show a house to a potential buyer. Her husband later drove to the house and found her purse in her car and the door to the home wide open. Since then, police have arrested a former employee of the concrete mixing company where Carter's body was found. 33-year-old Aaron Lewis faces charges of kidnapping and capital murder. He pleaded innocent to those charges Thursday. The details are heartbreaking, but not terribly out of the ordinary for a murder case. So why is it national news? Well, it might have to do with the details surrounding the case. Suspect Aaron Lewis has displayed strange behavior both before and after his arrest. As the Washington Post reports, Lewis was involved in a car wreck on Sunday, saying a car he could not describe ran him off the road. He was a person of interest in the case at the time, but had not yet been arrested. The Post also reports Lewis was apprehended after looking nervous and suspicious at a shopping center. Civilians eventually cornered Lewis in an office building and held him until police arrived. Then there was this seemingly contradictory statement to reporters as he left court Tuesday. Why Beverly? Because she was just a woman that worked alone, a rich broker. Did you tell her? No. According to CNN, Carter also said he would have pleaded guilty to the charges against him, but his lawyer told him not to. Of course, there's Carter's story, too. Many have pointed to the vulnerability of a female real estate agent working alone. ABC reports many agents now fear for their own safety, and the agency Carter worked for has already requested a police detective speak to their employees to try to calm their fears. And there's the fact Carter seemingly did everything right, even calling her husband to let him know where she would be the day she was scheduled to show the house. Lewis has also reportedly faced charges in Kansas and Utah. He was on parole at the time of Carter's murder. For News, I'm Zach Toombs. So the numbers that you see in front of you, uh, going back to 2014, are from the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics. Those numbers represent the total number of real estate professionals that were murdered at work. Uh, these, are, these deaths aren't uh, your heart attacks or car accidents or slip and falls. These are actually classified by, uh, by counties throughout the nation as homicides, deaths at the hands of the other, of, of somebody else. Uh, those numbers are, are shockingly uh, similar to the number of deaths that, that occur to liquor store clerks, security guards, and other high-risk occupations in our, in our country. So I'm not here today to uh, make you paranoid. I'm just here to raise your awareness and um, kind of show you that, you know, everybody gets used to a routine and goes to work every day and gets used to a normal, but uh, you are not in a normal profession. And we're gonna get into significant detail about that. Uh, there are inherent risks to your occupation and um, people do are victimized uh, quite frequently. And sometimes those crimes include homicide. The real estate profession is a majority female, and uh, that by, by its sheer nature attracts a certain subset of the criminal element. What other legal profession can you think of where you're essentially a menu item to a, a, uh, a, to a predator? Um, the, 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 the nature of the job itself, you work alone and work odd hours and um, you know, your job depends on you going to properties or vacant properties and meeting strangers and uh, you know, basically putting yourself into a situation where you're extremely vulnerable. Uh, the numbers that you saw before reflected the homicides, but what's impossible to quantify 
are the, the numbers of real estate agents, both men and women that are, that are victims of uh, other crimes, which include just simple assaults, uh, being present when burglaries happen, uh, sexual assaults and, and robberies for property. Another thing I need to really uh, emphasize is the nature of our criminal justice system, especially here in California. Since 2014, there's been a push for criminal justice reform that's resulted in the, in the, uh, the lowering of, uh, of uh, sentences, the reduction of, of the prison population. And we literally have thousands, tens of thousands of people who before 2014 would have been locked up in state prison, serious violent felons and, uh, you know, violent felons and property offenders. And now they're living back in our communities, sex offenders, uh, drug addicts. Uh, we have a tremendous homeless problem, uh, people that are breaking into uh, vacant homes for shelter. Uh, so we have, we're working in a very challenging environment. So just be aware of that. So our objectives today, um, number one, I want to sharpen your intuition. Uh, the author of Oprah's favorite book in 1997, Gavin DeBecker, wrote The Gift of Fear. I highly recommend this. You can get it uh, on Amazon now for about five dollars, uh, but it is the the remains the best work uh, that describes what intuition is. And Gavin De Becker defines intuition as knowing without knowing why. Uh, we're not the strongest animals in the animal kingdom. We don't have the sharpest senses, the best eyesight, the best sense of smell. We're definitely not the strongest or biggest. But what we are blessed with is the most sophisticated brain and processing center. Uh, intuition is essentially the, your, your entire life experience. Uh, whether you realize it or not, your brain retains every thought that you've had, every sensation you've you felt, every memory, every touch, everything is cataloged in your brain. And you, your body uh, uses that to process uh, subtle and uh, obvious and not so obvious cues in your environment to prepare you uh, to respond to danger. So we're going to talk a lot about that and we want to sharpen your intuition, get you back in touch with your intuition so uh, you learn to rely on it. I mean, uh, the standard, uh, you know, real estate safety class tells you, you know, when you're, when you have that feeling in the pit of your stomach, you do something about it. Well, I'm telling you, and you're going to learn today what that feeling in the pit of your stomach is and what some of those cues are and, and move them from the less subtle or invisible category to the obvious ones when you know what you, you need to look for. We're going to uh, talk about a new business process, which, which uh, revolves around vetting your clients before you ever meet them face to face. So you get a better sense of their background, their history, and um, that, you know, if they're a, a, re a registered sex offender and putting you in a arming you with better uh, intuition and knowledge about somebody before you ever make the decision to make meet them face to face. I'm going to cover office safety tips, uh, safety with clients when you're actually showing property. When you stage an open house, what, what specifically should you do to increase your safety? And I'm going to touch on self-defense. So what you see before you is the crime triangle. And in criminology circles, this, this represents the three elements that you need to have present for a crime to occur, any crime. You need to have a victim, you need to have a motivated offender, and you need to have the circumstances or opportunity or con environmental conditions uh, that create the environment where uh, the offender uh, decides to victimize you. All you need to remember as it relates to the crime triangle is to concentrate on removing one or more of the sides. If you can remove yourself, the offender, or the conditions, the, the likelihood of a crime occurring is virtually nil. So as we progress through this, we're going to talk about how we're going to remove each of the sides. So let's start with removing the offender before you ever meet them face to face. Uh, I want to teach you a process, a, a comprehensive process that you should go to go to go through every single time uh, you start developing a prospect or turning them into a client. And that that includes conducting a pr protective intelligence research, looking into their background. And here is why. Tonight, a real estate agent kidnapped, and the circumstances are puzzling Elk Grove police. 
There was some dialogue. There was uh, commands, threats uh, as far as the, his uh, stability. We don't really know that at this point. The frightening crime unfolded in a new development area. It's near Kissimmee Oaks High and the Auto Mall, and that's where we find KCRA 3's Claire Dewan live now with what happened. Claire. Rob Kelly, you can see how new this area is by taking a look at all the undeveloped land behind me. And across the street, this is the home where it happened, one of three model homes the agent was trying to show the client, but police say that client ended up holding her captive. What happened here happens everywhere daily. Realtors meeting with prospective clients to show homes. But one agent discovered this afternoon meeting would be unlike any other. The real estate agent had made an appointment with the suspect to see the, the homes. During the interaction, the suspect pulled out a handgun, threatened the real estate agent, and then handcuffed her. For almost an hour, they say, the suspect moved the agent to different areas of the home. She was not sexually assaulted or injured. At this point, we do not believe anything was taken. Um, we're still in the process of having her walk through the residence to see if anything's missing. Police say eventually the suspect, for an unclear reason, released the agent from the handcuffs and drove away in a red truck. The agent flagged a security guard nearby and called the police. Now, the suspect was not in a mask, so police do have a description of him. Investigators are now going through forensic evidence inside that home and looking at the correspondence and phone calls between the agent and that client to find out exactly uh, who that person is and what happened today. Live in Elk Grove, Claire Dewan, KC3 News. Well, Claire, before you go, do we know if there was any kind of a motive here? Yeah, police do not know. It is bizarre. They admit they did not hurt the agent. They didn't take anything from the home or from the agent. So definitely, Rob, something they are looking into. All right, Claire Dewan and Elk Grove. Thanks, Claire. Here's what we know about the suspect. The victim described him as a mixed race man in his 50s, about 6'1. He weighed 200 pounds. He had furry facial hair. He was also wearing a long gray shirt, blue jeans, and black boots. And he left in a red truck. Police want to hear from you if you know anything. So just like um, most news stories that you hear today, the initial reporting is wrong. Uh, it turns out that the realtor was actually, uh, unfortunately, um, sexually assaulted during this. She was raped. And um, when the Elk Grove police, which Elk Grove is a uh, suburban community outside of Sacramento, when the Elk Grove police um, uh, use the victim's the realtor's cell phone to try to trace the originator of the of the text messages that led to this uh, encounter and when they they tracked him down and they announced his name i did knowing how our systems work and what information is available to us i ran that suspect's name through the california megan's law database and um here he what here he is uh, Mr. David Timothy Bernhardt was at that time was a registered sex offender for a conviction for forced oral copulation. Uh, he lived in the Sacramento area. His address was included on this and uh, there was his picture. My, my first business practice lesson that I want to encourage each and every one of you to start doing today before you ever establish a professional relationship with somebody ask for a text copy, have, a, have them take a picture of their state issued ID or driver's license and, uh, and a picture with them holding, the, holding it up next to their face. Uh, if they ask about it, just uh, tell them that it's a new uh, you know, insurance requirement from your broker. But uh, creating this condition where somebody uh, has to prove who they are before they meet you face to face, it's not something that people aren't used to. Uh, in some places, when you use a credit card, they ask for photo ID. You go to a bank and you, you make a deposit, they ask for a photo ID. You test drive a car, you, you, pr you provide your driver's license. Uh, why it isn't common practice in real estate, I, I don't understand or I, 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 don't, uh, I don't agree with, but I strongly encourage you to do this. Had that real estate agent in Elk Grove requested a photo ID from uh, Ms., uh, Mr. Bernhardt before meeting him face to face, first of all, I, I, it's highly unlikely that he would have uh, done that and he would have just moved on and tried another realtor. But if he had and she, her next step had, had been to take that picture and run that name through the California Megan's Law database, uh, she would have discovered that he was a registered sex offender. Um, so. I, I must tell you that registered sex offenders have every right to purchase property. Uh, however, 
that is a huge red flag. And um, if you do discover that a potential client has is, re is a registered sex offender, um, you should you should seriously enhance your safety plan by bringing one or more people with you, uh, telling people where you are, and uh, you know having having plans. That's a decision you have to make if you ever find yourself in that. But it's better to be armed with that knowledge to avoid any potentiality of um, being uh, victimized by somebody who's you know these are public records. You can run anybody, any neighborhood, any house, any city for sex sex offenders. So the the information's out there. So it's a strong measure of safety that I encourage you to do. Uh, here's another example. This occurred in Mississippi. So a realtor was uh, scheduled an appointment with somebody and uh, this Mr. Kenneth Fox sexually assaulted this realtor. And when I found out about this crime and he was arrested, I ran his name through the National Sex Offender Registry, which I'll, I'll show you later, um, that you can access through the US Department of Justice. And he turned out to be a registered sex offender, not only in Mississippi, but also in Illinois. So you frequently deal with people that are moving in from other states and you do have access. It's, it's federal law that every state has to maintain a, a, an up-to-date sex offender registry. So not, don't only run them through the California Megan's Law database, but run them also through the National Sex Offender Registry. There are other free resources that are available to you so you have a better understanding of the crime trends uh, within the communities that you live and work. Uh, this is a snapshot off of crimemapping.com. You should bookmark this on your personal device and uh, on, your, on your computer. But you can run an address and a date range and it will tell you the crimes that have been reported. This, uh, this picture here is in Oceanside. Uh, this will show you within a certain time frame of your interest what it, what's occurred in the community that you that you work. It's very important to know. It makes you more professional as a real real estate agent. Uh, you know you you can uh, um, have a better understanding of the community uh, and uh, you know serve as a resource to your clients. And also, if you're showing properties in these neighborhoods, I, I think having access to that information helps sharpen your intuition. If you know that there is a, a pattern or a series of daytime burglaries that are occurring and on a certain block in a neighborhood in a community that you work, um, that's knowledge that can save your life. If you're showing an open house on a weekend and you see a suspect vehicle that uh, matches a description of one in one of these police reports, then uh, you have you're armed with knowledge and you can uh, get out of there and get to a safe spot quicker. So crimemapping.com is an excellent resource for you. Again, you can run addresses and you can run cities, date ranges. You can look at all of the crimes that have been reported there. Uh, crimemapping.com, uh, it uh, basically uh, has contracts with law enforcement agencies throughout San Diego County, Orange County, LA, all over the nation. And uh, they take their publicly available crime information and load it onto this, uh, this server and you have the ability to access it. How do I know so much about what happens in, as it relates to real, realtor safety? I've created a Google alert. This is a, a, an easy resource for you to do. It basically uh, does all the research for you. But essentially what I did was, uh, I, if you Google the term Google alert, this page comes up. You can enter search terms. So Google will send you every day, at, once a day, a, a, uh, an email containing links to every story, every news article or reference on online related to that subject. So I've Google set Google alerts for realtor attacked, uh, realtor victimized, realtor murdered. And every day, no matter where it happens in the world, I get a, a, an email with a link, link to those articles. So uh, whatever subject you're interested in, from cooking to re realtor safety, uh, this is a free resource. It provides you with information. And if you're not interested, you just delete the email. But if you are interested and it piques your interest, it, it pushes it to you. You don't have to pull it. It's a great resource and helps uh, sharpen your intuition and helps you remove those sides of the crime triangle, it makes you more aware of the industry where you work. This is California Megan's Law website. So I did a search for a uh, one mile uh, per area in, in uh, Carlsbad. And this is what it looks like when it comes up. So I have a uh, Mr. Gabriel Zamora here lives at 3660 Harding Street. And if you click on that link, it, it gives you a bigger picture of him, his, his address and his charge 
for which he is required to register. Again, excellent information to have. Uh, so if you're showing a property and someone that looks like that comes, comes in during an open house, uh, you have forewarning about their background and uh, you, you have the opportunity to um, implement your safety plan. This is the, the search box from the US Department of Justice's Sex Offender Registry. Uh, this is a link that you should bookmark on your personal device as well. So when you get the copy of that driver's license, if it's from out of state, even in state, uh, run their name and, and uh, through this website and it will send you directly to the state with, in which they're registered. It is worth noting that not every sex offender is a registered sex offender. There are certain offenses that aren't. And those that are registered as sex offenders, some of them are registered for offenses that might not include sexual assault. Like if, if uh, they were, some, some states make you register as a sex offender if you're caught urinating in public and, uh, or, or, or you're drunk. So again, um, that's just one snapshot of somebody. And I'm gonna show you how to do a little bit deeper dive into their, into their uh, background, do a, a additional searching uh, so you can develop a, a bigger picture or a better picture of their uh, backgrounds. So every superior court uh, in, in the state of California uh, gives uh, citizens the ability to access online court records. Uh, if you are entering into a professional relationship with somebody, I think it, it's a good resource for you to be able to see if they've uh, been, uh, been a defendant in a criminal case or even a plaintiff or a defendant in a civil case. You, if you're doing a business deal with somebody, wouldn't you want to know if they have a history of being litigious, filing lawsuits? Uh, you can log on to the San Diego Superior Court uh, case access webpage here and uh, search people by name or case number. Uh, some of these counties, including San Diego, um, you have to you have to file an online account for each search. It costs, it's just it's a nominal fee, and I'm not saying do this for everybody. But if you are questioning somebody's character, you wanna know a little bit more about them. These are very valuable, easy resources um, that are very inexpensive to get a, a again, again, start building a picture of somebody's character uh, before you ever meet them face to face. There are links in this presentation to all of the local counties in Southern California. All of them offer this service and uh, they're easily accessible and uh, just, I, I wanna relay this information to you. Uh, you may never need it, but just be aware that it, it is there and it helps you sharpen your intuition and become more aware of uh, people that you're dealing with. There is a ton of valuable information available for free online from all over the world. This is one particular site that I use regularly when I was a detective and I was doing backgrounds on people, but this is called BRB Publications. It's brbpublications.com. And it basically links to all kinds of free resources within the country. If you wanna see if somebody has a professional license, like they're an attorney or a pilot or uh, their property tax records, uh, you can use this site to link to not only to California, but all 50 states to find out more information about them, again, to develop that picture about them. Very, very good information and free at your fingertips. PQ.com. PQ and the next one that I'm going to show you, Zabasearch, are incredible tools. Most of us have social media accounts, and uh, these uh, are essentially public free resources, initially free. You, and they make you, if you want to get more detailed information, they, that's their business model. They kind of hook you in, they give you a taste of somebody's background, but uh, this is a good place to start. Um, getting somebody's profile and uh, looking, you know, searching them on for Facebook and Instagram and Twitter um, is a really a, a pretty good idea to to kind of get a, a flavor of what they're, uh, you know, kind of like where they're coming from. If somebody calls you and wants to see a property and they give you a story about, you know, relocating from out of state and they have children and uh, you know, they're looking for a particular property and they're trying to increase pressure on you to make you, you know, get you excited to sound like this is a, sh a, a sure thing. Um, slow down a little bit and, uh, you know, check their social media. Uh, Peak U, it, it does a good job, even with social media accounts that people have marked as private. 
PQ has the ability, and I found it, it's extraordinary, but it has the ability to find pictures and video and social media accounts that have been marked private by people and, uh, and link to that. So it shows you prior addresses, shows you their, their uh, photos from their social media where they've showed up online. It's like a, a, a Google search on steroids. Uh, run yourself on this and you could find out shocking information. You can see how scary it is, how easy it is for somebody else to find you. Now I'm teaching you this as a realtor. So you can, you can, you can research somebody as a client before you ever meet them face to face, but understand that, that, that sophisticated predators can do this to you. And it is, it's a warning for you to reduce your social media presence or reduce the amount of information that somebody can, can find out about you and later use it against you or use it as a way to develop rapport with you. It works both ways. So I'm gonna talk about that a little bit later in more detail. Zaba search is another one. It's an excellent research. You can search by phone numbers, addresses, and names. It shows you prior addresses going back years other friends and family members that are associated with that. These companies, both uh, PQ and Zaba, uh, get their information. Whenever you purchase an appliance and fill out a warranty card, uh, they, uh, those companies, uh, banks, they, uh, they sell the, your, your private information to these information brokers. And this is, uh, this is where it winds up. Now there is a process. If you find your, you run yourself on these, you can uh, go. They make it very hard to do. You go to have to go to the privacy tab, but you can you can request that they remove all of your personal information from this to reduce your profile online, which I encourage you to do. But uh, you have to do it about every six months because um, they're constantly buying uh, information from the private sector. And if you go out and again you fill out a warranty card, you buy an appliance, establish a credit account with with uh, a store or a bank, they, they do sell that information to these brokers. So it's a never ending process. Here's another tip for you, very valuable. Uh, subscribe and like all the social media uh, accounts for all of the law enforcement agencies in the areas where you live and work. Uh, law enforcement does a very good job these days of outreach to the community and sending out information about crime trends in communities and what's going on, uh, emergency alerts. So um, all of these have uh, all, Oceanside, San Diego Sheriff's, San Diego PD, Escondido, uh, o Carlsbad, they all have Facebook pages, they all have Twitter, Instagram. And these are just some screenshots I've taken from their sites that show you um, you know, they, they send out pictures of wanted people, you know, down here, San Diego Sheriff's Department sent out a bulletin on a sexually violent predator in Palma Valley. Uh, again, it's great information. It gets pushed to you. You don't have to, you don't have to go out and look for it. And it keeps your intuition sharp, it keeps you more aware of the crime trends that are going on in your community. And if you don't need, need it, you scroll past it, but at least you have it. And you don't have to watch the news every day. You just, when you're checking your phone, you get these steady reminders that there is crime in the, in the communities that you work. And it makes you just a little bit more aware and sharpens that intuition of yours. Talk about personal marketing. Uh, be aware of uh, the strategies and the photographs specifically uh, that you use to um, advertise yourself. Now, realtors are notoriously good looking people. And if you got it, use it. But just remember, there is a subset of the criminal element out there, uh, specifically sexual predators that view real estate agents essentially as prey. And like I said at the beginning, can you tell me another legal occupation where essentially you can log on to a computer and find somebody that matches the, the object of your desire and get them willingly to show up to a, a, uh, a place of your choosing at a time of your choosing. So um, be very, very cautious about how you market yourself. These are actual uh, images that have been taken from realtor marketing. And, um, you know, what I like to say is be professional, uh, not provocative. Now, uh, male realtors, uh, I've seen marketing where they, you know, they're leaning up against an exotic car, flashing a Rolex that again, for, for luring um, a, a potential robber that is showing uh, predators that, that you uh, value material possessions and that you're potentially wealthy. 
Think back to the first, the Beverly Carter story that I showed you in the very beginning when they interviewed Aaron Lewis in the back of the police car. They asked me, why Beverly? Why did you target her? And he said, because she was a rich broker working alone. Uh, that is a mistaken impression. We all know that most realtors are not wealthy, but a lot, uh, a lot like to give the impression that they are, and there is a false, um, a false impression that uh, realtors are wealthy and are frequent. That's why they're frequently targeted. So again, be professional and not provocative. Limit your personal information available to the public. If you have a Facebook or an Instagram account. Um, separate your personal and professional ones. Uh, do not accept friend requests on your personal ones from people that you do not know personally. And uh, don't post any family pictures, vacation pictures, anything like that, and nothing provocative that shows where you live, where you like to vacation on your professional page. Lock down your privacy settings on your personal ones, on your personal accounts. And again, keep your personal and professional life completely separate. You do not want to, uh, some of these, these suspects, including Mr. Lewis that, that targeted Beverly Carter, uh, have the ability to access this information. And if you're putting personal information out there about your family and they know how many kids you have, uh, where they go to school, where you like to vacation, uh, they, they have the gift of gab and their sociopaths and they can use that information against you to develop rapport and get your guard down. So be very, very cautious about the information that you put out there. Uh, guard the personal, uh, guard your personal information with clients. Again, we're, I'm going to talk in much more detail about rapport building with people and about uh, detecting body language and uh, suspicious behavior through conversations with them uh, that should set off warning bells. So again, you uh, be very cautious about the information, uh, especially in, initially with somebody about giving out too much personal information. Let your character and integrity attract clients and not your physical appearance. At your office, first impressions matter. You, that you learn that the, the hard way in law enforcement. You know, when you show up on a call and you look terrible, you look terrible in uniform, you, you're out of shape, you're overweight, you don't, you're not aware of your surroundings, predators pick up on that immediately. I'm not saying that you need to be in tip top shape or dress like you're a, you know, a martial artist or, you know, have cauliflower ear or uh, anything like that, but being confident, uh, having an office that's well lit, that has a receptionist. If you work in an office that engages everybody that comes in, you want to set the tone and in instituting a business practice of, of asking for ID before you ever meet them face to face. All these first impressions uh, are immediate signals to predators that you take safety seriously, uh, that you're squared away and professional, and um, that you're not an easy victim. Maintaining information security is absolutely critical. I can't emphasize it enough. Separate your personal and professional lives and your, your social media accounts. If you work in an office, only have one door accessible to the public. And when somebody walks in, there needs to be a receptionist or at least an employee there that looks them in the eye, greets them professionally and smiles and engages with them so they know that, that, that they're walking to a place where people are invested in safety. Uh, when you do establish a relationship with somebody, you can download client information forms off the National Association of Realtor website it asks for their addresses, their vehicle descriptions, um, you know, their license plates. It's great. You need to you need to fill that out. Keep a copy of it and also have it accessible to people that you work with, either your broker or a fellow agent, so they know who you're with uh, and have access to that information. And if you work, uh, you know, if you work in a strip mall or in an office, make sure there's adequate lighting outside in the parking lot. Um, that, uh, you know, that it's a safe environment when you're coming to and from work because these predators know it's a majority female occup occupation. And if they, uh, there's a real, real estate office, uh, all they need to do is hang out in the parking lot and look at their, uh, look at the realtors coming in and out. And, uh, and uh, you know, you don't want to give them a, an attractive environment to, to do that. So, when you work in real estate, you need to start thinking and establishing uh, contingency plans. Designating a duty agent is, a, is an idea that um, helps maintain accountability for people that are out, your co you yourself and your coworkers that are out there showing properties every day. Somebody needs to be responsible and know where everybody is and be able to provide backup if they need it uh, and have 
client access to client information sheets. There needs to be somebody that knows where you are, who you're with, where you're going, and when you're going to be back, and how to get a hold of you. It doesn't have to be a fellow employee. If you work, uh, you know, by yourself, then it should be a significant other, loved one. Uh, a spouse, a friend, another agent, somebody needs to know who you're with and what, you know, have that information and be, be able to get you help if you need it. You need to have contingency plans. What if I'm out on a, a showing or if I work in an office and somebody creepy comes in or a homeless person comes in and wants to use the bathroom, everybody needs to be on the same sheet of music. Workplace violence. I had uh, an unfortunate, one of the most traumatic things I had to deal with at work was the Salon Meritage uh, massacre that occurred in 2011 in Seal Beach, where uh, one of the, uh, the hairdressers at this salon in a strip mall named Michelle Fournier, her ex-husband um, was stalking her and was very violent. And everybody in that workplace knew that he was violent and had a temper and would hang out in the parking lot or come in and yell at her. And um, they never really discussed any plans if he shows up. And sure enough, one day he walked in there, uh, he parked in the parking lot, shot somebody outside, uh, came inside and wound up shooting and killing eight people. And uh, they're a very hard lesson from that, but everybody brings their personal life into the workplace. And you know, I just be aware of what's going on. If somebody's going through a bad relationship or has a crazy ex, you need to talk about what, what everybody's going to do, like lock the door if they show up and call the police or lock down, go to the, you know, barricade yourself in a storage closet or, uh, you know, flee out the back door uh, and, uh, and uh, ha have a plan if that happens. It can save your life. What if somebody that you work with has a medical condition? Does one of your coworkers uh, have a heart problem or suffer from epilepsy? Do you have AEDs in the office or have a plan if somebody has a diabetic uh, emergency? Again, have contingency plans, talk about it ahead of time. So hopefully you never need it, but if you do, you already have been there mentally. And then if something happens, your order of response, no matter what it is, is to first get out of there, run. Second, if you can't run away, uh, you hide. And if you can't hide uh, and you have no other choice, you need to fight. So, and, and here's uh, how that plays out. It may feel like just another day at the office, but occasionally life feels more like an action movie than reality. The authorities are working hard to protect you and to protect our public spaces. But sometimes bad people do bad things. Their motivations are different. Warning signs may vary, but the devastating effects are the same. And unfortunately, you need to be prepared for the worst. If you were ever to find yourself in the middle of an active shooter event, your survival may depend on whether or not you have a plan. The plan doesn't have to be complicated. There are three things you could do that make a difference. Run, hide, fight. First and foremost, if you can get out, do. Always try and escape or evacuate even when others insist on staying. Encourage others to leave with you, but don't let them slow you down with indecision. Remember what's important, you, not your stuff. Leave your belongings behind and try to find a way to get out safely. Trying to get yourself out of harm's way needs to be your number one priority. Once you're out of the line of fire, 
try to prevent others from walking into the danger zone and call 911. If you can't get out safely, you need to find a place to hide. Act quickly and quietly. Try to secure your hiding place the best you can. Turn out lights, and if possible, remember to lock doors. Silence your ringer and vibration mode on your cell phone. And if you can't find a safe room or closet, try to conceal yourself behind large objects that may protect you. Do your best to remain quiet and calm. As a last resort, if your life is at risk, whether you are alone or working together as a group, fight. Act with aggression. Improvise weapons. Disarm him. And commit to taking the shooter down, no matter what. Try to be aware of your environment. Always have an exit plan. Know that in an incident like this, victims are generally chosen randomly. The event is unpredictable and may evolve quickly. The first responders on the scene are not there to evacuate or tend to the injured. They are well trained and are there to stop the shooter. Your actions can make a difference for your safety and survival. Be aware and be prepared. And if you find yourself facing an active shooter, there are three key things you need to remember to survive. Run, hide, fight. So uh, that information uh, as it relates to active shooters, run, hide, fight, um, is exactly what you need to remember in any personal safety situation. When you're in danger, your very first uh, inclination, the very first thing you should do is get out of there. And there's a term called get off the X. The X represents that, that, that exact point in the crime triangle where the, the victim, the offender, and the opportunity come together. X marks the spot. You need to get off the X. If you can't do that, uh, the next best thing to do is hide. Barricade yourself somewhere uh, and call for help. And if that isn't, um, you're not able to do that, then you need to fight and fight with your entire, uh, you know, with speed, surprise, and aggression. So th that applies in any circumstance, from showing property to being out on a night, being out at night, for a night on the town with your significant other, run, hide, fight. So back to the duty agent. Um, again, I strongly emphasize everybody here to have somebody uh, that's accountable, that knows where you are at all times, a friend or family member or a coworker that has uh, designated contact information for, for you, uh, can, can uh, get you help, uh, maintains your itinerary, checks in with you if you need help, provides backup if you're not comfortable with somebody, having the ability to call them or text them and have them slide by the property to, to be there with you to give you an additional measure of safety, and, or somebody that can call 911 for you if you're in a position where you can't. Uh, very, very important to have somebody as a duty agent. 
So let's talk about what we should do when you are, are out with a client or planning to be out with a client. Uh, get, have, give you the itinerary and, the, the, uh, and, and access to the client information form to the duty agent. Again, the duty agent it doesn't necessarily have to be an agent, but somebody, a, a friend or family member. The days of driving a client in your car to a property should be over by now. Think of your car as your escape capsule. That is the a sterile, uh, uh, a sterile escape pod that nobody else should have access to. That is your way to absolutely get off the X. If you need to get out of a, a dangerous situation, you need to get to your car and get out of there and get to a safe place. So take separate cars, ask them to, to meet you at a plate with today with GPS and Waze. Uh, there is no reason that uh, anybody should be lost or need to be escorted anywhere. Give them the address and meet them there and then uh, be, have your ability to, to escape by keeping your car just to yourself. Stick to a planned route. If you've got multiple properties you're gonna show in a day, let the, you, the, your, the duty agent or your significant other or friend or family member uh, know, you know the, the order that you're going to go. So, and if, if you deviate from that, let them know. Uh, your car should be well fueled, good, in good me mechanical condition, uh, working, you know, make sure your door locks work. Do you keep a weapon in your car, like a flashlight or a, uh, you know, a, a pepper spray, um, anything. Do you have anything in your car that if somebody gets in there with you that, that, that uh, you don't want in there, do you have a way to defend yourself? Constantly be aware of your surroundings in every environment, when you're driving, when you're walking up to the property, and, uh, and when you're in the property itself. And I'm gonna talk much more about that as we keep going. Uh, know the location of the closest, uh, sheriff or police station or fire station along the route. You know, if, you, if you're in trouble or somebody's following you or if the person's creepy, um, pull in, there's nothing wrong with pulling into a fire station and asking them for help or, or asking them to call the cops. Just know your, the area where you work. Pre-incident indicators. Let's think about this. You know, this is intuition at work. About 90% of our communication is nonverbal. And uh, especially in law enforcement, we become experts in reading people's body language. Uh, you can, that is an excellent way to be in tune with your intuition. And uh, most people can identify with this. Um, we use this in law enforcement uh, as, a, as a measure of safety. We have the ability to, you know, after getting experience, to be able to look at somebody's uh, their, their, uh, their, the way that they behave uh, under particular circumstances. Uh, those of you that are experienced real estate agents recognize that most real estate encounters with your clients kind of fall into a bell curve. You know, m m the vast majority of your interaction with people, about 80% of the time, is normal. It's a happy, you know, uh, time, you know, that. People are relaxed and, uh, you know, engaged with you, but there are people that suffer from, um, you know, men, you know, psychological issues or may have substance abuse problems that fall on the, on the margins of, of the bell curve on either side. You need to be highly in tune when people are falling out on the margins with their body language. Uh, what we look for in law enforcement with potent, that kind of tells people that are getting ready to, to either run or fight or uh, are, uh, you know, potentially dangerous, we look for large muscle group movements. Everybody's heard of the fight or flight response. That's a physiological response that every human being goes through when uh, they're, they're put into a dangerous situation. Not only does, it, does the victim display this when something sudden happens, like if you get in a, uh, if you get in, into a near car accident, you get that feeling, you know, you slam on your brakes, your heart is racing, your, your, your body is shaking. That's the sudden uh, uh, dump of, of uh, hormones into your body, cortisol and um, adrenaline. And that can't stay in your body very long. So if you turn it around and think about a predator or a suspect, um, uh, they are getting nervous when they're getting ready to to uh, to pounce or to to victimize you, and they're getting the, that slow and steady dump of adrenaline and cortisol as well. And you can't maintain being having those 
hormones in your body for very long and it's, they, they have to be burned off. So when you see somebody that looks like they're stretching or sh shrugging their shoulders or moving their hips, uh, you know, looking like they're about to run or, you know, they're, they're stretching and it, it just is not normal behavior. That's a huge red flag that they're going through the fight or flight response. Just be aware of that. If somebody starts asking questions that are a little too personal for a professional relationship, that's a huge red flag. If they start asking you questions about dating or intimate relationships and you just met them in a professional environment, um, you need to start thinking about getting, getting out of that situation. Look, look at what they're wearing and are they carrying anything? Do they have any bulges in their pockets? Do they have, could they be carrying a weapon in their waistband? Are they dressed unusually for the weather? In the Beverly Carter case, um, Aaron Lewis lured Beverly Carter to a lakeside rural property outside of Little Rock, Arkansas uh, in, the, in, the, in the early evening, right before dusk. He told her that he wanted to, uh, that he and his, his wife, uh, Crystal, wanted to see that property. But when the, the day came, Beverly drove up in her own car. Uh, Aaron was there by himself. They later uh, learned through, uh, through analyzing the evidence of the crime, inclu including her cell phone and the picture she took inside, that she went in um, and uh, basically uh, she was, uh, he pulled out a weapon and uh, duct taped her and then put her in the, in the trunk of his car and drove her back to his house where he held her uh, for ransom until she suffocated and um, she, you know, he, he murdered her and buried her. But uh, he was able to smuggle in a weapon and duct tape into a, into a showing. And uh, we don't know how, how he did that, but there, there had to have been a tell. And just be aware of that. And if at any time you start getting that feeling, your intuition is telling you that, you know, their gross body movements, their, or their, their, uh, their rapport building with you, they ask inappropriate questions or talk about inappropriate subjects, you need to start getting out of there, getting off the X. Jazz police say the victim was hired by a Metro real estate agent to help get the suspect's home ready for sale. According to court documents, the victim had a funny feeling but decided to stay because she didn't want to lose the contract. Anytime anything happens in the industry, we kind of all um, just kind of take a deep breath. Metro Realtors reacting to what police say happened inside a home on Thomas Court near Northwest 192nd and Penn. Court documents say Jason Haddad was inside his house alone with the victim. Police say as the two were going room to room, Haddad asked her, quote, what her fetishes were. The victim was, quote, caught off guard and did not respond because she wanted to remain professional. The two continued throughout the home, and according to police, the victim found numerous sex toys, a rope, and handcuffs in one of the rooms. Police say after that discovery is when Hassad sexually assaulted the victim. The victim telling investigators that Haddad had mentioned to her he had military training, which she says kept her from fighting back. Local agent Kirsten McIntyre says incidents like this show the potential dangers of real estate. I mean, you're going into a home and you're closing the door and you're alone with somebody who you don't know. McIntyre suggests agents not go into homes alone. As for Haddad, he'll be charged with intent to commit rape and sexual battery. Zachary Alcasio, 5 News. So that is a perfect example of uh, being aware of red flags. Uh, the second that that real estate agent uh, started, uh, you know, saw the sex toys or uh, when, when he started asking her uh, provocative questions, that is a, that is a textbook case of uh, getting off the X and getting out of there. So please, please, please be aware of that suspicious activity of the fight or flight response, have a plan to be able to get off the X and be able to get out of there. So here are the items that I highly recommend that realtors carry with them on every showing. Um, a lot of, I get a lot of questions about what's the best weapon to carry. Uh, you know, I, I teach a lot in Orange County and I don't know how San Diego County is, but the Orange County Sheriff issues a lot of concealed weapons permits, firearms permits to realtors. So a lot of real estate agents are, are going down that path. 
Um, I can discuss that later after the presentation, but I will tell you that, uh, you know, that is a huge commitment and um, it's, uh, you know, I'm a proponent of it, but you need to be trained and, and uh, be willing to take somebody's life. But short of that, and no matter what environment you work in, these are the things that you should have at all times. The first thing that I recommend is that you purchase a high quality uh, LED flashlight that has the following uh, uh, features. That it's about four to five inches long uh, uh, and, and it has a pocket clip on it. Now, the one that I personally carry in law enforcement that I, that I um, again, I, I don't make a dime off this. I'm just telling you from personal experience. This is called the, the uh, Surefire Defender, the E2D Defender. I'll hold it up to the camera here so you can see. Um, but uh, this is an aluminum flashlight that, that has a pocket clip on it here. It's about four inches long. And if you look at the bezel where the light comes out here, not only is it a very bright light that you can use, you know, you should be carrying, you should have a flashlight on you at all times when you're showing properties because some of them are, don't have utilities and you can find yourself in a situation where you need to uh, illuminate something. But these particular uh, flashlights have a striking bezel, a very sharp bezel around the top here. And then also where the thumb switch is, uh, this is designed to be able to use as a striking implement. So you can distract somebody. And then if you hit somebody as hard as you can with this, or if they grab you and you have this flashlight on you and you jam it into their arm and rig it down, you can cause a lot of damage. Hit them on the bridge of their nose. It's a very powerful uh, striking implement and a very powerful flashlight. This particular model by Surefire, um, you can order uh, off the Surefire website. And they're over, this is the, the Cadillac of them. They're uh, over $100, but you can buy one from Streamlight or Olight. There are many uh, manufacturers out there that, that, that um, make these. But what, what's so great about this is, is the simple pocket clip. No matter what you're wearing, like I carry this in my left pocket. And all that's visible when it's in my, in my trousers or my jeans is just the very top here. So it's very inconspicuous. Ladies, no matter what you're wearing, if you're wearing a skirt, you can tuck this into the inside waistband of your skirt in the same place every single time and pull, put your blouse over it and, and, and hide it. But you always have it on you. And it's a phenomenal tool to have. So highly recommend a, a high quality LED flashlight with a pocket clip and a striking surface, a defensive flashlight. Secondly, your cell phone. You get in the habit of keeping your cell phone consistently charged. If you're sitting at your desk at home, it should be hooked to the charger. If you're in your car, you should be, you should have your, your charger going and it should always be in a full charge. And then when you're showing a property, you need to have your cell phone on you, like it, like in your back pocket or, you know, have have a little lanyard around your wrist, but have it on you because that is your lifeline. Now, this is a good time for me to talk about some apps that are out there that are marketed to real estate agents. And there's a whole bunch of them that track your GPS location, uh, give you the ability to push a button and it sends out notifications. In fact, if you own an iPhone, there's a feature on it called emergency SOS that you should all know about. If you hit the the, uh, the power button on there five times quickly, it broadcasts your location uh, on, on a map and, uh, and tells people that you're in trouble and can get you help. Now, cell phones are fantastic and they're great. They're a huge part of our lives, but they're also a, um, a very big distraction. So I, I have to emphasize that having an app, a realtor safety app is, a, is as an addition to your safety uh, plan enhances it but it is not a safety plan. Your safety plan needs to be your preloaded uh, mental models, your, your uh, contingency plans that you already have thought about and practiced that, that are in your mind, run, hide, fight, and your ability to implement that to get to a safe location to call for help. Uh, you should not be distracted when you're out in public or you're conducting a showing. You're, you need to have your wits about you. You need to have your... So you need to be aware of your surroundings and where the exits are in the house that were, how, how, you know, where your escape plan or your, your, the bear, the hide part, the room or a closet where you could barricade yourself and be constantly thinking about uh, how am I going to get out of here? If, the, if, if, I, if this uh, client or somebody, something unexpected happens. And then finally, pepper spray. 
a lot of realtor associations, uh, you know, you go to the, the CAR conference, they always have somebody there that sells uh, personal safety implements. Um, buy a high quality pepper spray that contains uh, uh, OC or oleoresin cap capsicum, a good law enforcement grade pepper spray. Uh, do, I am not a fan of the small uh, keychain ones that 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 uh, you know they sell at uh, at these conventions that have about two seconds worth of pepper spray that comes out in a little dribble. Uh, you can buy a good quality pepper spray that has a pocket clip on it um, for uh, you know twenty or thirty dollars at any uh, gun store or um, Turner's or True Outdoorsman, Bass Pro Shops. You can order them online. Some reputable, a reputable ba ba uh, brand is DefTech uh, or Federal, but uh, purchase a good law enforcement quality pepper spray and keep that on you as well. And buy one that has a, a pocket clip. So you keep your flashlight concealed on one side and you're on your waistband or in your pocket and your pepper spray in the other. So no matter what happens, if you have to defend yourself or you have to open up a sliding glass door under stress, you have the ability to operate with one hand and pull out your self-defense tool or pepper spray with the other. You need to have a primary and a secondary means to defend yourself uh, to create time and distance. Another word about pepper spray is that uh, just like any aerosol, it runs out of uh, pressure after a couple of years. So I would rec recommend that you buy yourself a new one every year and take the one from the prior year and test fire it again with the wind at your back. But uh, you need to be able to see how far the, the, uh, the stream comes out. You need to purchase pepper spray that, that is marketed as a stream and not as a fog. You want distance and the ability to reach out and target that stream of pepper spray right into the eyes and face and nose and mouth of, a, of an offender. Uh, the stuff that comes out in a fog is very short range and also has a tendency to get in, into your eyes as well. So buy a stream. I have every single time that I've used pepper spray in real life in law enforcement, I have wound up getting it in my, my own face. And um, you, need to, you need to feel that And when you test, no matter what, if you test spray pepper spray, you'll get a little bit back and you need to experience that. So you know that it's uncomfortable, but you can fight through it. It's not gonna incapacitate you or the person you're spraying. It distracts them and it hurts, but again, nothing is 100% foolproof. And then uh, aside from carrying a high quality flashlight, your cell phone and your pepper spray, you need to wear footwear that you can uh, run, run in if you have to. Uh, you have the ability to get away quickly or in, and you're wearing clothing that you can run or fight in. Very, very important. Now, when you're actually show, do, conducting showings, there's a variety of things that can happen. Uh, primarily sexual assaults. Again, predators pick realtors because they know that you work alone. Um, and um, you're at a high risk for that particular crime. Uh, male or female agents ha are, are regularly robbed for personal possessions for jewelry and watches and cash and wallets and credit cards and cell phones. Uh, burglary, uh, people will, will uh, go out with a realtor and then when you're not looking, they'll go into a medicine cabinet and take prescription, steal prescription drugs. Uh, violent assaults, just people, transients walking in on somebody that's a that's a homeless person that's crashing in a in a in a foreclosed property uh kidnapping like beverly carter and and again squatters walking in on people that shouldn't be there uh you, you're exposed to many dangers so when you're doing your showing you need to be aware of the property before you ever show up there so check the sex offender registry check the neighborhood see if any of the adjoining properties or the people living on the block are registered sex offenders uh, you can look at property records uh, through the, the county clerk's office online. You can look at the, at the crime mapping and look at the, the, the crime that, that occurs in the neighborhood. Uh, speak with the neighbors, get to know the neighbors. So, um, you know, as long as they're not a sex offender, uh, but speak with them, um, you know, find out more about the property. And then if you're there, if you've shown it to more than one client, if something ever happens and you're screaming for help, they know that a realtor is over there and they'll get you help. Look at, Stop look and look at the front of the property and um, just look at it from a criminal perspective. Are there bushes or overgrown hedges or um, anything that's blocking the view from the street uh, where somebody can hide? Uh, do you have the ability, if you have to escape that property during a showing and you can't get back to the front door and you go out a slider into the backyard, is there a way to get from the backyard back to your car that's parked on the street out front? 
Uh, you can kind of figure that out by looking at the property on Google Earth before you ever go there. Just again, you're preparing yourself that, you know, that crime triangle, you're reducing the opportunity for something bad to happen to you. Are there any nearby sheriffs or fire stations or police stations that, that you could go to if you need, when you escape that you can go and get help at? When you show up to a property, always, always, always park on the street, never in the driveway, especially uh, because you're taking uh, two cars. You never want to find yourself in a position where your car, your escape capsule is blocked in. So park with enough room in front, if you have to parallel park, where you have enough room in front of you, where you, you don't have to keep backing up and moving forward to get yourself out of a tight spot. Back into a spot so you can see the front tires of the car in front of you, and then, and then cut your wheels to the left so you can get in your car, uh, turn on the ignition, drop it into drive, hit the gas, and you're out of that parking spot in a hurry. Uh, keep your car keys accessible. Keep them in, you know, tucked into your waistband in the same spot every single time. So if you find yourself in a situation where you're being chased or you need to get to your car, you're not fumbling in your purse for them. Uh, you have, they're in the same spot every time and you can get to them. Uh, you don't need to wear fancy jewelry or have any valuables with you that are attractive targets for opt opportunistic criminals. Leave all that stuff in the trunk. Uh, be aware of your surroundings. If, you, if one person is supposed to meet you at that property and more than one show up, that's a little bit of a red flag. Uh, so be aware of your surroundings. Uh, when you approach the front door, stop, look, and listen. Uh, look for obvious signs that there might be somebody in there. If it's a, supposed to be a vacant property and you smell the smell of urine, that's a, that's a, a telltale sign. If there's no utilities, that there's uh, a squatter inside that's uh, that's uh, you know relieving themselves outside. Look for water bottles, uh, backpacks, anything like that is a huge red flag. Don't go into that property with a client or by yourself, if you think that somebody's in there, call the police and have them clear it before you ever go in. Um, if when you go up and you open up the lockbox, have the client, don't have them hovering over, over your shoulder. Ask them to wait on the sidewalk or by, your, by their car while you conduct your, your survey. You stop, look and listen, uh, open up the, you know, knock on the door, announce your presence, and then open up the door and let the client walk in first and you stay behind them by the front door. So this is a controversial subject, but uh, I recommend that when you were doing a, you're doing a showing and you're by yourself and you go into the property uh, and you go inside, lock the front door so nobody can come in behind you. Uh, you need to know how to open up the front door uh, and access it to get back to your car and get out of there. And I also recommend that you, um, that you stay at least in the central area by the front door while the client has free free room, uh, free room, access throughout the house. Don't put yourself in a situation where you are uh, you have a, a client blocking your escape routes. Never go into a, a bedroom, a closet, a garage, a laundry room um, with the client behind you. I just encourage you to stay by the front door, uh, like in the front entryway area. And then if they have questions, they can ask you questions. But really, what value do you provide uh, anybody following them around, you know, a stranger around inside of, inside of a house by yourself, pointing out the obvious to them? They're going to like what they're going to like. They're going to, you know, they're, they're, they know what they're looking for. Um, you need to just be aware of your surroundings. And while they're looking through the house and you're answering questions, uh, looking for your primary and secondary exit points. It's a good time for me to mention that uh, uh, General Mattis, who is uh, the former National Security Advisor and a retired Marine General, had a very famous saying. He said, be polite, be professional, but have a plan to kill everybody in the room. Now, I'm not saying that you need to have a plan to, to kill your clients, but you need to have a plan and be thinking about those plans while you're professional uh, at, at all times, no matter what circumstance you're in, uh, doing a showing or conducting an open house. Uh, we learn that in law enforcement. We carry a lot of tools on our belts and you know, some are better at it than others, but you learn to be polite and professional and smile and be, be approachable. But I'm always thinking, what am I gonna do if this person grabs me? What if they pull out a gun? Uh, what if they take off running? Uh, I, can, I can walk and chew gum at the same time. But uh, you need to have that same mentality when you're conducting uh, these high-risk activities that include showings and open houses. 
And if at any time you feel nervous or they're displaying red flags or you're getting that, your intuition is telling you that this isn't right, trust your instincts and get yourself out of there immediately. Get to a safe spot and call for help or just break contact, get off the X and, uh, you know, uh, write off the client and, and uh, live, to, live to be a realtor another day. Constantly think when you're in these, even beforehand, Think of how you're gonna react in these situations. What if this is what really happens in real crimes? What if this person grabs me or pulls a weapon? What if somebody else shows up that, that we weren't counting on or they didn't tell me about? What if I can't get to the front door? Have I identified a, a slider or a back door? Do I physically know how to open up that lock or open, access that door without looking at it? I might be, be in a position where I'm having to fend somebody off and I have to do it by, while reaching behind my back. And, and you know practice opening the door you need to you need to do what if I can't what if I lose my cell phone when I'm running where am I going to go um, and and if I have to fight if I'm in a situation where I can't run away or hide and I have to fight is there anything in this house or any what, what I have on me have I practiced with it do I know how to use it as a weapon and first and foremost really do I have an excuse to be able to break contact and still be professional about it you know, ladies, think about it like uh, trying to get out of a bad date. You know, um, I'm sure there's a million uh, ways that you can you can talk yourself out of it, but you need to have those readily available and on the tip of your tongue to be able to disengage. And always, always, always trust your instincts. Now, open houses. If you're going to conduct an open house, this is another high risk one because uh, you know many realtors place signs and advertise they're going to be there by themselves and. Um, you're in a situation where you can't vet people that are coming in. So it's always better to have somebody with you. You, you can rely on a friend or family member or a fellow agent that doesn't have anything going on that day, or you can rely on a lender, you know, have a, have a, a you scratch my back, I'll, I scratch yours, have a professional relationship with an affiliate that, uh, you know, they'd be able to market their product with you. And, you know, you have more than one person sharing. Arrive early and scout the property. Identify your exits, practice opening up the doors, every single one of them, all the way around the perimeter of the house. Practice opening up the gate to get from the backyard to the front yard. Again, plan with the end in mind. If you find yourself in a situation where you need to escape, can you get out of that house? And if you can't get to the front door, the secondary exit or a third exit, is there a walk-in closet or a room in there in that house that has a lock that you can barricade yourself in and maybe climb out a window if you have to? You need to establish your primary, secondary, and third order escape routes. Um, whenever a client comes in or some, somebody comes in to look at the property and they're, they're checking it out, when they leave, make sure that those side doors and back doors are locked so they can't um, be working in concert with somebody else, scouting it out and then unlocking a back door and have, have somebody sneak in without you, your knowledge about it. And again, Stay near a central location. Walk behind people if you're going to follow them around. Stay in a central area where you can get you can get to the front door or get out a side exit and, and stay in doorways so you're not trapped. If you don't have the ability to, to show a property by yourself, and I'm not, I'm complete, I'm, you know, I'm very realistic about this. I understand you can't do that. You know, business is business. At least think about this. Um, give the illusion that you're with somebody. Have an open house kit with you. You can download these signs, like the notice, all activities monitored by video camera. You can keep those in an in a, in a open house kit and put one on the, on the front door or the front entryway or the mailbox. Um, and then when somebody walks in, if you have a laptop with a camera on it, like, as, like we're doing here on the Zoom call, have a laptop out front. So when somebody with the camera on, so when they walk in, they see themselves on the video. And even if you're not recording them, it gives the illusion that you are. And that you, there's a CCTV camera there. For uh, 12 or $15 on Amazon, you can buy a set of four dummy cameras. You can put out the sign that says that the place is under video surveillance. And these dummy cameras have a little two-sided tape on the bottom of it. You put one above the front door and you put one in the you know, in the hallway or above the master bedroom in conjunction with a, a, your laptop. And it really makes it look like that place is under video surveillance. I've seen real estate signs all over the place where it, sho it shows, you know, gives a, especially a female's name, you know, like 
uh, your name and you're, it gives the impression that you're by yourself showing a property. So if there's some predator out there that's looking for a mark, they know, hey, there's highly likely there's a single female in that house by yourself. So if you're going to make up signs and show that you're going to be there, give the illusion that you, you're doing it as a team, like uh, James and Sophie there. Uh, even if you're going to work by yourself, have your signs make it look like you're working with, that you have a, a partner. In your open house kit, have a, have a sport coat um, and drape it over the, a, a chair uh, in the kitchen or the front or, or by, uh, you know, right next to you to make it look like somebody is there, but maybe had ran to go get something to eat. Bring it, bring it to uh, hydro flasks or, um, or, or cups from a, from a, uh, or, or a Starbucks mug and use we statements, you know, pretend that you're speaking with somebody and they're going to be right back on your cell phone when, when, when people are in the house to keep them off balance and make them think that you're, that you have a partner. Uh, again, think creatively to give the impression that you're, that you're not by yourself to reduce the, the possibility that they might target you, but um, being, you know, because you're by yourself. If you observe somebody committing a crime, you know, if they're stealing from the open house, uh, you need to just get out of there and be a good witness. Never confront anybody. That's not your job. That's law enforcement's job. Get out of there. Get off the X. Call 911. Be a good witness and give, your, give the description to the, um, to the police. Uh, but you are, you are not a cop. Let the police do police work and you do realtor work and just get out of there and call for help. Now, I'm going to touch on self-defense here. And unfortunately, uh, you know, we're not in a position where we can practice any moves. But just like there's three sides to a crime triangle, the, the victim, the suspect, and the opportunity, and that there's three options uh, when you're faced with a dangerous situation, run, hide, and fight. When it comes to self-defense, there are three Ds, detect, deter, and defend. Overall, you know, if you think about just philosophically, self-defense is your responsibility. The average response time to a 911 call in the United States for an immediate threat to life or property is about 11 minutes. In Southern California, you're, we, because there are so many law enforcement resources and, and uh, you know, more affluent areas, you can, it, it's generally about five minutes or less, but five minutes is a long time if you're fighting for your life. So you need to, Resign the, resign to the fact that you can't rely on the police to, to get there to, to, uh, to defend you. You need to be prepared to do that on your own. You need to have a warrior mindset. And again, it's not being a, you know, you don't need to need to be a martial artist or anything like that, but you need to be constantly a, a, a student of personal safety and crime trends, and at least always be progressing and, and working to make yourself uh, better at protecting yourself. Uh, Self-defense is the overwhelmingly more of a, a mental state. You don't need to have a whole lot of physical skill, but you need to be, you need to be, have that warrior mindset and be mentally prepared to do it. It's not the size of the dog in the fight. It's the size of the fight and the dog. If you find yourself in a situation where you, you, you can't run and you can't hide and you need to defend yourself, you need to attack the attacker. You need to overwhelm them with speed, violence, and surprise. And that means using every tool at your disposal to, to be the badger uh, or the honey badger against the cobra. You need to overwhelm them with your violence so they, they, they decide that it's not a good idea to attack you. And you don't need to be big or exceptionally skilled to do that. Some of the toughest people I've ever met are some of the the the... the you know, physically the least impressive, but man, that you can just tell by looking at them, by the way they carry themselves and that, that, that they mean business and they, you know, they're, they, uh, they project confidence. Uh, when you need to defend yourself, you defend yourself with everything that you have, and then you, you overcome the, the aggression, and then you escape to a safe spot. So you need to be prepared physically and mentally to defend yourself so it's not a surprise. Boyd cycle. This is otherwise known as the OODA loop. It's very important to understand this, but this, is, this, this model was coined by Lieutenant Colonel John Boyd, who was an Air Force tactician, who basically was asked by the Air Force to come up with a very simple model to train pilots to, uh, to uh, be able to prevail in every encounter. If you understand this concept, not only do you prevail in a self-defense situation, but it applies to sports and business as well. 
uh, there are four stages to this. He or she who observes their opponent ahead of time has more time to be able to, to go through the preloaded uh, mental models that they already have thought about, their contingency plans to decide the correct course of action and then act. It's very simple. Uh, and this is how our national security is, uh, is, uh, is modeled in the United States. This is how uh, effective sports team coaches are able to coach their teams you know, in the fundamentals. But if you have good situational awareness and you pre-thought about likely outcomes, if you find yourself in a bad situation uh, and have thought about it ahead of time, if you see the threat before they see you, you have the ability to be able to draw on that response and act and implement it before they ever get a chance to hurt you. So let's think about this from a, a predator, a very simple um, example. I grew up watching, you know, the Bugs Bunny Roadrunner Hour when I was a kid, and one of my favorite cartoons in that was uh, Roadrunner and Wild E. Coyote. Wild E. Coyote was constantly trying to come up with schemes to be able to uh, to uh, get the Roadrunner and have have the Roadrunner for dinner, constantly cooking up new ways to lure them into a trap. Uh, every single episode, Wiley Coyote would find himself, you know, setting up a trap where he would he would balance an anvil on a on a, a cliff above a desert highway, and then he would take out a brush and he would he would paint an X on the desert floor and then put some seed in the middle of the X. Roadrunner would come down the road and he'd see the seed, but he'd also see the X, and he knew before he ever got there that. Uh, that the that wily coyote was setting him up. He had better situational uh, awareness and better intuition. Roadrunner would invariably get would turn the tables because he had better observation, and uh, wily coyote would figure out a way to. The roadrunner would always trick him to get into the X where the anvil would drop on his head. You need to be the roadrunner with good situational awareness and good contingency planning, good awareness of crime trends and and body language and inappropriate behavior and have all the preloaded plans. If somebody grabs me, if they pull a weapon, where are my exits? You have the ability to go through this decision make, making cycle quicker than the predator does. They might have plans and, and have thought that out. But in that process, if, if uh, you observe them before they observe you, you put them back into the observation mode. So again, the OODA loop, observe, orient, decide, act. Very important to understand. Detection is always situational awareness, avoiding dangerous situations so you don't find yourself having to use defense. Be the roadrunner. Always be on the lookout over the horizon for, for trouble. Uh, leave before there's a confrontation. Be aware of body language, all of that stuff. Detect, detect, detect. It's always the safest approach. Hopefully you'll never have to use self-defense because you're aware of your surroundings. Deter, carry yourself in a manner where you are the lion and not the antelope on the plains of Africa. The lion always targets the, the uh, antelope that has its head down or, or the zebra that has its head down and is unaware of the surroundings. Be the lion, be a hard target, project self-confidence. You, you don't, again, you don't have to be the toughest person in the world, but if you, if you can't make it, fake it, look like it, shoulders back, head out of the cell phone, being confident, making eye contact with, with people. That deters a lot. Criminals always look for the meek and the, those that, that don't project self-confidence. Uh, if somebody is approaching you or making you uncomfortable, be assertive and stand up for yourself. Tell them to back off or get the heck out of there. Get off the, get off the X. If, if everything else fails and you find yourself in a situation where you have to attack, the, that you are going to be the victim of a crime and you're, you're a, an immediate threat to your safety, you have the legal right and the obligation to defend yourself. You don't have to wait for somebody to hurt you. If you, you can articulate why you're, you're in fear for your safety and immediate safety, you can attack your attacker. And that's what you need to do. Self-defense is really not the correct term. You need to attack your attacker. So you attack them with speed, surprise, and violence of action. And what that means is that you hit them as hard as you can uh, with whatever tools you have available to you as many times in their vulnerable areas until they can't hurt you anymore. Then you get off the X, get to a safe spot, call for help, and scan for additional threats. In order for anybody to hurt you, they need to have three faculties. They need to have the ability to see you, 
They need to have the ability to breathe, to provide oxygenated blood to their major muscle groups, uh, their legs and their arms to, to be able to grab you and hurt you. And they need to have mobility or their joints to be able to, to move. So if you need to target any location on a human body with, with strikes to, to defend yourself, target one of those, either their eyesight, their breathing, uh, which could mean they're, they're you know, hitting them in the throat uh, or, you know, is very, very simply ladies and even men, the most vulnerable part on a man is their groin. So that's, that should be your first target. So um, aim for one of the three faculties, either eyesight, breathing, or mobility. That, and you take one of those away, just like a crime triangle, the ability for somebody to hurt you gets taken away. So ba as very simply as I can say, uh, for self-defense, attack your attacker's soft parts with your hard parts or a weapon until they can't attack you anymore and then get off the X. Now, if, if you want more information on self-defense or want to take a class to become more competent at defending yourself, um, there's a variety. Of, any training is good training, but if you want a crash course in what's effective, um, I recommend, and you're not, you're not interested in signing up to be a, you know, to take martial arts classes, uh, the Israeli self-defense uh, um, program called Krav Maga, K-R-A-V-M-A-G-A, -A -A, is a phenomenal martial art, and many of them offer one-day women's self-defense classes. For like 100 bucks, you can go, 50 bucks, you can go for, you know, four to six hours, and they'll train you on how to do this stuff in very realistic scenarios. So uh, just Google search Krav Maga in an area in San Diego County. I'm sure there's plenty of them, um, and sign up for a class, or better yet, if you want to live, you know, have the warrior mindset from this day forward, sign up and take, you know, for Brazilian jiu-jitsu or karate or boxing or kickboxing, anything where you can get reps in defending yourself. So in conclusion, I know this is a lot of material and I went very quickly, but uh, what we talked about today was creating in a, a concentric circles of defense to provide you uh, safety at work. We started with situational awareness. That's being aware of your surroundings at all times, subscribing to the social media feeds of the law enforcement agencies that are the areas where you live and work. Watch the news, sign up for, for Google alerts so you find out exactly what type of crimes happen in the, real, the trends of crimes against realtors. Protective intelligence. Starting a business practice today of asking for an ID, a photo ID from a potential client before you ever meet them face to face, and then using the online tools like simple Google searches, PQ, uh, Zaba search, and of course, the Megan's Law and the US Department of Justice Sexual Offender Registry, you need to run everybody through that. We talked about your office safety, run, hide, fight, having contingency plans, having a duty agent, somebody that knows where you are at all times. Uh, what having contingency plans for creepy clients or how to get help to somebody that's out in the field that, that is uncomfortable. And then finally, personal safety. What tools, high quality flashlight, pepper spray, cell phone, uh, being, being polite and professional, but having a plan to address any threat that can happen to you, getting off the X, being aware of detect, deter and defend. Um, all these layers provide you with uh, a, a more effective way of viewing yourself, your, your, uh, your, your personal and office safety and give you specific concrete tools and how to protect yourself uh, in your personal and professional life. So if you want any information about this, um, um, I'm very passionate about it. You can follow me. I, I, I put out content on my Facebook page, Crisis Control Solutions. Um, on a regular basis, I, I post articles about crimes against uh, real estate agents, and I discuss a lot of this stuff uh, uh, regularly. You can follow me on Twitter at Crisis Control One. You can check out my website at CrisisControlSolutions.com. But uh, implementing all this creates a hostile work environment for criminals. So, without uh, further um, content, I'd like to open it up for uh, any questions you may have. Let's see if I can. Uh, pull up the chat feature here. So I'll go through. Uh... Oh, let me pull it up here. So uh, let's see. Yeah, crime mapping is useful only for crimes that have already happened. That's correct. And that's, you know, in law enforcement, that's the reality. But we use that 
past is prologue, knowing patterns. And uh, you know, if you see a cluster of particular crimes in a neighborhood, uh, that's a pretty clear indication that something else is gonna happen again. So again, that's just good background information to have that increases your intuition. Uh, who do we contact to run a person's ID? Uh, that's something that you have to do yourself. Um, or you can, there are some online uh, information brokers you can subscribe to that do, um, LexisNexis is one of them, where you can pay a monthly fee and you get some additional information that they have, but it costs a lot of money. But just simply running a simple Google search, checking PQ and Zaba search, and then uh, running them through the sex offender registry is a, is a uh, gives you a general uh, uh, sense of somebody's background, looking at their social media accounts, looking at the pictures, making sure that what they're telling you on the phone or on online is uh, kind of jives with what their profile is. Um, I had a buyer with a picture ID, but unable to find any trace online about them. Nothing is 100%. Um, if they don't, if they don't have any match on uh, the sex offender registry, that's a good thing. You know, check, just uh, use the tools that I gave you to do the best you can. Um, but if there are any red flags or somebody has been, um, you know, like in a newspaper article is on a simple Google search of being arrested for a crime, um, people leave trails, and uh, the tools that I've given you give you a, a little bit of a a little bit of a measure of uh, safety. Um, Let's see. What about Life 360? Uh, Life 360, I believe, is a uh, is a as a subs uh, subscription. Again, it's another. There's lots of them out there. Uh, all of them are good. Um, don't rely just on one. But a lot of this you can do with the free resources I've given you. Legal issues regarding pepper spray. Pepper spray is legal in the state of California. There are places that you can't take it, like into airports, uh, schools university campuses, but you can carry it on you uh, virtually everywhere. So uh, no legal jeopardy, unlike firearms. Uh, list of one page for all those red flag websites we have to check through. Um, send me an email uh, at crisiscontrolsolutions at gmail.com and I will, uh, I will send that out to you. I have a, a sheet or I'll send it to Shirley and then she can send it out to you. I have a, a document that lays all that stuff out. Uh, what about stun guns? Very good question. I, I neglected to talk about that. So I can tell you definitively, as somebody that's carried a taser for uh, almost 25 years, that uh, they, the police uh, versions of those are effective about 50% of the time. And the police ones that, uh, that we carry actually shoot out uh, barbs that stick into, that uses a neuromuscular incapacitation, meaning you get a a probe goes into a, a suspect's uh, large muscle group like their shoulder and one into their leg. And then when it activates, it sends an electrical current between those two barbs that are spread apart and contracts those muscles and makes people you know, fall to the ground. But it only works about 50% of the time. The stun guns that are sold and carried by realtors have, uh, are meant for contact. Uh, they have two probes that you touch and essentially it just contracts that muscle between the two probes. So I like to just refer to it as a, as a, as a pain compliance tool. I am not a fan of them. You've got to replace the batteries and they do nothing really honestly than piss people off. They don't incapacitate it like in the movies. Again, under the best conditions with the, the best equipment that's out there, the police uh, the police tasers, they're only effective about 50% of the time. You get much more effectiveness and bang for your buck with good high quality law enforcement pepper spray than you do a stun gun. Uh, let me see if I could figure out how to get, take you guys off of uh, mute. And if anybody has any questions, um, we'll try opening it up for questions because I see there's uh, 25 people. So we should, I should be able to accommodate you. Lindsay, maybe if you can come up oh, here, here we go. Unmute all. Can, all right. All of you should be uh, unmuted. Can, uh, does anybody have any, any questions? Let me try it again. Let me try and unmute. Unmute everybody here. Uh, 
Um, Jeff, if you click on the panelist button and you go over their names individually, it'll say allowed to talk. So oh. if they raise their hand, we can allow them to talk individually. Okay, so I'm on the attendee. I see one question here from Marla. Okay, Marla. Okay, Marla. Hold on, let me try it again. Can you hear me now? Now I can hear you. Okay, great. Okay. So you said uh, on our phones, uh, we have an emergency SOS. Um, if I were to hit that, where would the notification go to? So you have to set that up ahead of time. If you have your iPhone in front of you, as I do here, let me see if I can pull it up. If you go to settings um, and then go to um, under general, there's a emergency SOS. Uh -huh. Do you see that? Do you have an iPhone? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm opening it now. Okay. Go to emergency SOS. And then uh, when that, when that comes up, Oh yeah, there we go. You see those options. And then un under emergency contacts, you can add whoever you want to that. Oh, I see. So it would send them a notice. Correct. It sends your GPS location and uh, you know they, they can get to you. So um, it also gives you a countdown. So in order to activate that, if you if you kind of scroll up, it's it says you, you push um, the top two buttons on your phone, the, the single button on the left side of the phone, or yeah. on the right side. And, right. and top volume up at the same time, five times in a row. Yeah. Uh, it activates it. Uh -huh. So it's a great feature. Yeah. You know, and see, I have my sister and my dad on here, but you know what? I would rather have somebody else, uh, <laughs> yeah. you know? Yeah. Be sure so, to tell them that you're putting them on there though. So when they get yeah. the notification, um, you know, it's, it, it should be a, a bad situation when, when, when you activate that, you know, that it's a, it's a serious emergency. So essentially if you can't dial 911, if you do that and that, that notification goes out, you should tell them that if you get that from me, yeah. just call 911 and give them my address and right. get me help. Okay, great. Good question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Any other questions? Anything else? Okay. Well, I don't see any more questions. So um, thank you very much for the opportunity to be able to present. Um, please, if you if you like to further connect, you know, follow me on uh, Crisis Control Solutions on Facebook, uh, or um, you know, visit my website. Send me an email at crisiscontrolsolutions at gmail .com or call my call my number. And uh, I'd love to discuss that with you. And if you like the, the class, um, please uh, you know, tell other realtors about it. I love spreading the word and I'd like to everybody to work together to get those numbers down to zero. Um, every year there's about 20 realtors that are murdered at work. And a lot of that can be prevented by having some understanding of this content. So again, thank you so much for the opportunity. Uh, good luck, be safe out there. And if you have any further questions, uh, you know how to get, get a hold of me. Take care. Have a great day.